welcome. Today we're here with David Harper from Land and Common. I'm really excited, David. You're my first American interviewee and your first one in person, so I hope everything goes well. But I'm really excited to talk to you about land and how we work with land, how we worked with land through history, um, and in particular, the history of land ownership. So let's start there. Have people always owned land? And how has that relationship with land ownership shaped our culture and how we view land? Well, thank you, Fiona. It's great to be here with you. And thank you again for hosting Eco Interviews. I feel like this is a very important series that uh, can and should go global and excited to be part of it. So thanks for doing what you do. Yeah. So um, my work with land really starts with a calling, I would say. I mean, I think we all have a calling uh, if we listen closely enough and for me the calling had to do with looking at land as not just property but more of a common something that is timeless is ancient and really is our connection to earth uh, our home eco being home so um, for me that calling has to do with healing the relationship between humans and the earth I feel that um, when I look at my lifetime from 1965 to present especially in America um, the amount of, of the ability to extract and convert landscapes has increased exponentially. But my understanding is that property is really a newer concept. And I brought an example of how, to me, property is a newer concept. Um, if you can see that, this is a deed, and it's framed. It's been in my family since the 17, well, 1717, that's the date on the deed. See, it's a sheepskin deed. It's got the wax seals on it, and it's all written in hand, quill, pen. But it's not to say, isn't this cool, I have this deed. What's cool about it is it's for 467 acres. It's for land that is in southeast Pennsylvania, what we now call Chester County, Pennsylvania, and it was even called Chester County then. But it's outside of Philadelphia, and this actually is one of the first deeds that actually was on that parcel of land. Because if you think about it, before 1717, what was there? It was the Lenai Lenape Indian land, so Native American land. Um, they didn't have deeds. So when did it become property? It, it really became property probably right around 1717 when the King of England granted land to William Penn. I don't know why it was his to grant in the first place, but apparently it was because he had a bigger set of guns and a bigger navy. And um, this land got passed down through the family and eventually became developed into housing. So interesting point though is what is a deed? What is title to property? What is ownership of property? And I'm not saying it's good or bad, I just sold a house. I love owning a house and being able to buy a house, but sometimes I look at our pattern on the land and I think a lot of it is tied to this idea of land as a commodity, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, so previous to land ownership, let's just think about what that is. What, what was there before deeds, exactly? So, thinking about earth as a commons, I mean, it's hard to really say what that means. You can look back at traditional or indigenous cultures around the world, and they may have fought over territory. I mean, North America is a great example. There were always, in some cases, spats and disputes between different tribes about land, but it, but it was never about ownership of the land. It was simply about where, what was their territory? What was the, the part of the earth that they were dwelling on essentially and hunting on and fishing on and so um, when we look at Europe obviously there were there was a trend called the enclosure X period which really started probably in the 13 and 1400s and continued up until the 1700s but enclosure X the way I understand it was essentially a way of monarchs and kings saying uh, we would like to have more control over these parcels of ground and so we're going to pass laws that say if you're a noble, if you're a monarch, if you're a king, um, this land is under your control and it's no longer hunting land for commoners or uh, grazing or farming land. So, so that idea of the Enclosure Act is a very important period in history because the reason there's a 1717 deed in America 
I think is directly tied to that period because it was the sense that land can be a commodity, land can be property, you can have a surveyed boundary and that becomes something you pay for and own. So, um, so yeah, I, I think we're wise to look around the world. Look at the Amazon today or look at Borneo or the Indonesian rainforests or the Congo in Africa. The destruction that's going on as we speak um, has a lot to do with commodifying that land because prior to that it could have just been native territory and then under certain governments, those governments assume that that land is under their control, not, not the indigenous people's control, and suddenly those governments open up opportunities for corporations or for settlement, and that's just a recurring theme throughout human history. So how do we heal the human relationship with the earth um, through our relationship with land? as property or as an asset for the communities in which we live. Mm -hmm. And uh, you've touched on this a little bit, but this modern concept of land ownership and ha making a commodity, it's something that has shaped our uh, society completely. So can we explore some of those themes about how it shapes our society and then the effects it's had directly on the environment as well? Well, I can start by talking about the conservation movement in America because that's been my whole career for 30 plus years. I've been drawn to this idea that we can save land from, essentially from uses that we don't like or we don't agree with. So if you look at what are called conservation land trusts, the first land trusts in North America began right around 19, or 1891. So over 100 years ago, people in Massachusetts decided that there was too much logging, there was too much destruction of nature, and there were special places that they wanted to save, even in that Victorian era. So they formed an organization that essentially was like a museum, but it was a museum to acquire and own and hold land. And that became what's called the Trustees of Reservations. That's the first land trust in America. You fast forward to the 1950s and 60s when the first urban sprawl really started happening around major cities like New York and Philadelphia. Um, then you began to see a second wave of land trusts that began to say, well, if we create a nonprofit that can preserve good working farmland or important natural areas or water supplies, then that's a good thing because we can't stop growth, we can't stop development, but at least we can create more of a balance. And so essentially, to this day, the land trust movement has only continued to grow. There's about 1,350 nonprofit land trusts around the country. Um, m many of those benefit from the tax laws that allow a private landowner to essentially preserve their property and receive some kind of compensation, either through tax benefit or, in some cases, grants that actually pay for the right to preserve that land. So. Um, but if you, if you expand that out globally, probably the number one conservation entity in the world is called the Nature Conservancy. So they're one of the top nonprofit organizations anywhere. They acquire and own and manage land all over the world in all continents except, I think, Antarctica, um, essentially for the preservation of nature, biological diversity, and rare habitats and rare species. So the fact that those exist is a, say, is a sense of saying, there is a stewardship ethic among humans. Humans do know that we can't just keep taking, we can't just keep um, turning land into uh, commod commodities. And in fact, I think one of the best quotes that captures that stewardship ethic was a gentleman by the name of Aldo Leopold. He was a famous author and really a naturalist back in the 1940s and 50s. Um, he wrote a book called A Sand County Almanac that is considered in some cases one of the Bibles of the land conservation movement. And his quote was that we abuse land because we view it as a commodity belonging to us. When we begin, when we see land as a community to which we belong, then we will begin to use it with love and respect. And so that idea of community versus commodity abuse versus respect. I mean, those, those are very important terms in how we relate to land. So not to say that land use and land development are bad things. We all need to live. We all need to buy groceries, go to school, everything. It's really just a question of, are we designing with nature? Mm -hmm. The reason I went to graduate school in the early 90s to study with a gentleman named Ian McCarg, who was a well-known 
environmental planner at that time was that he had written a book called Design with Nature. And to this day, I use that in my work, and that is asking the question for the land to tell us how to use it, not for us to impose our will on the land. Mm -hmm. So let's do things in a way that fit within the ecosystem that we are part of and that supports our life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, super interesting, actually. Um, a few things that are running through my head, uh, treating land as a commodity, an easy, an easy example for me to understand why that doesn't always work is you may be able to put a fence around the land, but the stream that runs through your bit of land also runs through your neighbor's land, and the air that you breathe is all over. And so to treat it as my parcel, I can do what I want, is not being a good neighbor, I think, to those around us. Um, but also, I'm interested, uh, conserving, conserving land versus being, uh, being a human within nature. That is super interesting, because as you mentioned, yeah, we, we do have to live, we have homes, and that has always been that way from ancient times, that we have developed places to live and we developed the land to help feed us. And is there, I'm, I'm noticing it in some circles that there's a little bit of a backlash on the straight conservance, conservancy, I don't know if that's the right word, <laughs> conservation aspect of fencing off something and just not allowing anyone in it. Do you get into that aspect of all, at all? Yeah, of course. In fact, many of the conservation groups that started in the Northeast and in other parts of the country that were rapidly urbanizing, they knew that they couldn't save all the land. They weren't going to try to keep everyone out and just leave it for nature. So in some cases, groups that I worked with became uh, essentially urban planners. I mean, they were saving important woodlands and streams and farmlands, but they were doing it in a way that fit within the growth of an urban area. So I was involved with many sessions where we worked one-on-one -on -one with the larger developers in the nation, the larger home builders in the nation, to say, if you're going to put a hundred houses on a 200 acre tract of land, let's design it in such a way that is designing with nature that does fit with the land so that once those hundred houses are built it's not just gridded out as yet another wall-to-wall -wall subdivision but it's actually a human dwelling neighborhood within a park-like setting that still has the native plants and animals living there so that's one example um, but I think looking to the future there's a lot of opportunity to take this idea of a commons and say well can we create a nonprofit that owns and manages land, essentially holding it in trust for the community? So if you take land off the speculative real estate market, you take it essentially out of either being private property or public property like a park, what's in between public and private might be this nonprofit ownership that is more of a commons and essentially it can be created to hold land in trust for community use but the use might be agriculture in a way that is ecological farming. The use might be selective forestry in a way that still keeps the forest healthy but uses the timber wisely. So, so there are different ways to look at stewardship of land and ownership of land uh, that are not about fencing it off from humans but saying let's live responsibly as humans within the ecosystem. Love it. Is this something you're you're very involved with the agra agrarian trust? Is this a, a a theme within the agrarian trust? Can you talk to us about that? Sure. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. So, as part of the what I would call the evolution of conservation land trusts, has been a subset of those, or even a new version of those, which are called community land trusts. So essentially, a community land trust, instead of saving land for nature, saving land just to keep farmland scenic and productive, they're actually saying, how do we save land that's for the future of farming, that's for uh, beginning farmers to have access to land, even if they can't afford to pay you know, ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars an acre, which are often the prices for farmland close to where the market is, which would be urban settings or suburban settings. So uh, Agrarian Trust started probably 2013, 2014, uh, really grew out of a group called the Greenhorns. The Greenhorns was a national uh, movement representing the young farmers in this country, the beginning farmers, and essentially saying we have a voice, we have a presence. Even though farming used to be something that they, even the federal government said you either get big or you get out, mm -hmm. there's a whole generation of people now saying we want an agrarian life. I want to grow food for my community. I want to 
to work with the soil and do it in a way that doesn't use chemicals. And so that next generation of farmers, um, uh, essentially the group, the Agrarian Trust, formed as a nonprofit in order to hold land in trust for the benefit of beginning and next generation farmers. So it's working in different states around the country, um, assisting with some projects, uh, both through fundraising, but also through um, essentially helping landowners who decide that they either want to give land, gift their land into that agrarian trust or sell it and helping find ways to raise the money to buy that land. But these are often landowners who say, my farm is special to me, my farm means something to my family, but I want it to be a bigger legacy than just turning it, on, turning it over to the next farmer or to a developer. I would like my land to become a legacy that is a essentially a commons for food production in my community indefinitely. And that's what Agrarian Trust does. That's amazing. Yeah, my understanding of the um, the North American farming landscape right now is like the average age of a farmer is 65 or 70, and usually their children don't want to farm. They grew up in a, they, they're just not interested. That's quite common. You don't necessarily always want to do what your parents want to do. So. Uh, I've heard at least that there, there is going to be a crisis of land in the next 10, 15 years as these farmers die off and it's either going to be gobbled up by huge corporations that use chemical farming and monocropping and things that we're realizing maybe aren't benefiting us that much. And so, but then there's a whole generation my age who didn't grow up as a farmer but we kind of want to be farmers but maybe we don't have the capital. So it's exciting to hear that there's programs out there that are trying to, to address this problem, right? It sure is. In fact, I mean, I think we are at a crossroads once again in our history where the mantra of feeding the world keeps coming up. How do we feed the world? And um, there's a certain amount of assumption behind that phrase that we are going to feed the world rather than humans around the world feeding themselves. And so what does that look like? If it means 7.7 .7 billion people on the planet now projected to reach 9 billion over the coming decades or even higher, if it means creating technological solutions, industrial agriculture solutions, genetically modified foods, um, you know, laboratory foods, all the things that seem to be uh, coming up as profitable markets for feeding the world, um, that's a whole different mindset than a community saying, how do we provide food security and nourishment for our own community? How do we think as a region in a way that doesn't depend on global shipping, in a way that doesn't depend on Monsanto or Bayer or one of these companies to create the next genetically modified food or the next chemical-based agriculture system? How do we feed ourselves in a way that's really creating an economy within our bioregion. That, that term of bioregion is an important one. When I talk about native land, I mean, you look at where we are sitting right now today in Columbia, South Carolina, you can say this land has been property for probably 250, 300 years, but before that, um, or at least right around the 1600s and, and for thousands of years before that, it was essentially Catawba native people as well as Congaree native people. So if anyone doesn't know what their land, where they sit today, uh, originally was and who, who were the stewards of that land, it's an important question to ask. But as we fast forward to now, thinking about that bioregion, the same way the Catawba people thought about this region, we know it has pine forests, we know it has sandy soils, we know it has freshwater streams, and we know the species that live there the same way they did question is how do we work within those ecosystems? How do we produce uh, vegetables and fruits and meats and nuts and even dairy if we feel we need it, but how do we do that in a way that's um, designed to fit the forest ecosystem that is the natural system here and, and work within it rather than say we're going to get rid of the native ecosystem or replace it with our version of agriculture. So I think that that's an opportunity, bioregional food systems and food security rather than trying to feed the world from an industrial or a more corporate model. Nice. Can you, if you had a magic wand and you could make it, we can make this bioregion self-sufficient, can you give me some like ideas of what that would look like? <laughs> 
great example. Well, unfortunately, I mean, I'm not a doomsdayer. I'm, I'm what I would say a solutionary. I think there was a gentleman who was an organic farming pioneer named Tony Cleese who used to call himself a solutionary. And I've really, that word has stuck with me. I, I believe we all can be solutionaries. So if we take the route of optimism and hope, even as things get more uncertain, um, that means understanding the bioregion first. So if we understand the ecosystems, we, real, we really all can become naturalists. We really all can become gardeners in a sense and begin to think about food production more locally, even in our backyards or even in our community gardens or even in neighborhood farms that may be around the city. Where we are sitting right now, there's thousands of acres of good farmland within a 15 minute drive of the state capital of South Carolina. It's, mm -hmm. it's called Richland County or Lower Richland County and that's some yes. of the richest land around. So you would take a look at those food producing areas and say, how can they, how can we begin to restore them as ecosystems that produce food? So to answer your question, I would say, if we live in a naturally forested area, how can we mimic the forest ecosystem, but do it in a way that puts food on the table? So in other words, um, we know there are native pawpaws and persimmons, we know there are native pecans and hickory nuts, we know there are native even wild game such as turkey or deer or quail, um, but can we design food systems in a way that bring back some of that functionality of the native forest, but do it in a way that's still um, creating staple foods for the population here? And it, it may take a crisis before we get to that point. We might find that with uh, sea level rise and people moving inland and suddenly having to have a lot more people living in our communities inland from the coast, that might be the type of crisis we need to figure it out. Mm -hmm. In terms of the food system and the native, uh, the bioregion, as you said, I hope that we could look back to the people who were here before us, because I realize as I've gone back through history and reading things outside of what I learned in US high school, high school US history class, is that we, uh, you know, we came to land that was already settled. There were people here already who were thriving and we brought our, our agriculture over instead of maybe learning from the people who are already there. So but just like in a mini, mini version, you know, I'm excited to start growing three sisters in my garden. I really, I really want to do that, you know, because that, those were naturally farmed here and they should do well. And it's interesting that we struggle so much as well, you know, bringing agriculture from another land and trying to reproduce it here. I think so, a lot of our agricultural struggle is based on that. There's a lot of you know, abundance around us that is easier yeah. uh, to like the pawpaw, like you said. And so that's super interesting to think about. Mm -hmm. um, so as for the, there's, let's see, everyone's sort of on a different journey as to where they are with the climate crisis. What sort of advice would you give someone who's just start, starting to wake up on mm -hmm. this? Well, um, so I think we make a lot of assumptions that you're either with us or against us. You know, you either buy into that this is all caused by humans and we've got to dig ourselves out of a hole, or you feel like there are too many questions and we don't have all the answers and we'll just ride it out and see what happens. So um, whichever perspective you take, I don't think, for me, it's not worth putting energy into is this an anthropogenic cause or an ecogenic cause? You know, is it caused by humans? Is it caused by natural systems on their normal path? Um, I don't know that we have the answer to that. What I know is if you look at those curves of carbon emissions, it's pretty eye-opening within the industrial era. It's just, there's no doubt that, you know, carbon is in the atmosphere. Um, so the amount of you know parts per million that that what is it 400 plus parts per million? I mean, that's staggering compared to three million years of history where there have never been any evidence that that level of carbon has been in the atmosphere. I'm also amazed if you really research it and try to understand it. Um, you know there are different warming periods and cooling periods, and so we can't claim to know all of the history of those cycles throughout history prior to humans, but um, what we do know is that there are other forces at work too. If you think about all of the clearing of land that goes with agriculture, especially under industrial agriculture for the last hundred plus years, 
with tractors, with technology allowing more plowing, more tilling, more clearing. There's, there's a soil scientist, I think based out of Australia, a woman who, her name escapes me now, but her theory is that we've released so much soil moisture into the atmosphere, not just um, carbon, but the actual water that every year would be held in deep-rooted natural systems in the soil as a living soil. Because we've converted so many living soils into essentially dead dirt, you might say, um, that's, that moisture holding capacity is essentially gone in any given year so that so much more water is up in the atmosphere as soil humidity rising up that that in itself could act as a way of capturing heat on the planet. So if you combine carbon with things like methane, but also um, essentially saying maybe soil humidity is a greenhouse gas unto itself that we've caused, that's a pretty staggering possibility. So to me, all signs keep pointing back to ecological systems, whether it's human dwellings, whether it's energy production, whether it's food production, all of those point back to learning from the land on which we live, learning from the ancient natural systems that are here, and finding ways to mimic those. Essentially, it's biomimicry at a landscape scale. So that, that what, that's what brings us to the food forest idea. So if someone wants to have um, a vision for hope in the future, then perhaps it is not just saving farmland and not just preserving the idea of farming, but actually reinventing what farming looks like and reinventing how we feed ourselves at a community scale. Mm -hmm. So, I, um, yeah, there, that's a, there's a lot more to talk about there. <laughs> yeah, I, was, <coughs> I am absolutely geeking out so much right now because I'm doing a regenerative gardening course and I was completely unaware of the carbon sequestration ability of soil. So I want to do talk, want to talk about that because I think a lot of people don't understand that, myself included, until the past year. So, uh, and please correct me if I'm wrong on this, but you know, um, we have the parts per million in carbon is incredibly high, 400 parts per million. That is that is crazy, and it's the greenhouse gas, but it is also the degradation of our environment because as we were taught in school, plants take in carbon dioxide and they release oxygen and we take in oxygen and release carbon dioxide. So I find it interesting with some of these technological fixes for climate change is trying to create machines that are going to suck carbon out of the air when in reality we have that all around us. The ocean is a carbon sink and it's taking in so much carbon it's becoming acidified and so fish are dying. Our trees as we cut them down we're losing those. But you know, even our lawn, you know, the grass that we grow in our lawns is a very, very shallow root system and they just don't, they're not, they don't take in the carbon dioxide that maybe natural lawn grasses or trees or shrubs would take in. And not only is the shallow root an issue, an issue for the carbon sequestration, it also, also leads to the issues that we have with flooding and storm runoff. So, I mean, who knew that my lawn <laughs> was A, not, like causing issues, but be also a, a solution. You know, I can work on my little one acre and try and turn that into um, something that's going to suck the carbon down. And it's this whole circular motion that somehow people have extracted themselves from when the rest of the world is in this natural cycle. Talking about you know even breathing and eating, but also the food that we eat instead of it going to the landfill you compost it and it goes back into the garden and grows food and it just excites me so much so i imagine a, a lot of your uh you know uh, bio region and shrinking down of trying to make this local is including that is that correct yeah <laughs> exactly um one of my favorite quotes is from a guy named bill mollison bill mollison was considered the founder of what's now known as permaculture so permaculture grew out of a movement in Australia back in the 70s, but today it's worldwide. It's a very um, important concept that borrows from ancient traditions of indigenous people, but also looks to a future of ecological design, essentially says, how do we meet human needs? Shelter, food, energy, water, transportation. How do we meet those needs in a way that is uh, in harmony with our ecosystems. And his quote was, if we, if we all become gardeners, if we all just garden, 
this will be a different planet. And I think there's some truth to that. We've removed ourselves so far from um, the source of the water, the source of the soil, the air, the shelter, the energy, um, that if we find ways to reconnect with that, maybe it's joining a CSA that you know your local farmer, maybe it is being part of a community garden in your neighborhood, maybe it's putting a green roof on your garage, you know, a, anything you can think of that acknowledges that you are connected to these living systems is huge. And your point about living soils is probably one of the biggest. If, if you think of Earth as Gaia, you know, the term Gaia, Greek, I mean, the whole idea that Earth could be an organism, and if we really wake up to that, that not only does Earth contain living systems within this very thin biosphere, but all those living systems somehow function together to regulate the planet, we're part of that. So if we throw it out of whack with carbon, if we throw it out of whack with clearing way too much land for the systems to work, then the onus is on us to put it back in balance. If, how do we reset the balance that we've upset? And that can be through the types of personal tasks that you're talking about, taking responsibility for building healthy soil. I, I know when I compost, I have the feeling like every time I don't put compost in a compost bin and then back in the soil, it's like I'm starving the soil. You know, no matter where those groceries came from, they might have come from California, but if I'm not feeding the soil here where I live, and I'm just putting it in the trash, then I'm not really doing my job as a human on planet Earth. No, oh, I feel you. And I have friends as well as, uh, who, once you get into composting, if you go on a trip somewhere and you're not near composting facilities and you have that banana peel and you're like, I don't want to throw this in the <laughs> bin, it's, you know, you get that way. Yeah. So yeah, there's definitely the individual actions we can do. Like I said, personally, uh, I'm working on regenerative gardening. Um, trying to convince my husband to do some more permaculture. He's not excited about big mounds of <laughs> lasagna mulching in our front yard, but I think I'm gonna get him there. Um, but let's talk about on a bigger level because I do think individual actions together do make a big change, but in reality, we need systematic change. And that's either gonna be through our governments, which I find are very slow because there's a lot of interests that want other things to happen and they have more power and maybe voice than me alone does but you're in this nonprofit sector. So how do you see the nonprofit and the organizations that you work for being able to move forward with this sort of change? Mm -hmm. That's a great thought. Uh, you know, I, it, it may come back to property because that's kind of how I orient to the world. It, that if, if property is a relatively new concept and if property is part of the reason we are losing rainforests, if property is part of the reason that we have killed so many of our soils, then how do we reinvent our relationship to property? Um, and if you if you take an organization like the Nature Conservancy, which again is one of the most successful nonprofit or non-governmental organizations in the world, their ability to raise capital to acquire land as property and essentially steward it as a biodiversity commons, a commons for native plants and animals, whether it's coral reefs or tropical rainforests or the tundra. I mean, those bioregions that they're helping to protect are examples of resetting that balance that we talked about, that humans have upset. And so if you take that same model of a nonprofit that has a global footprint, but do it in a way that that global footprint connects with the people who live in those communities, wherever they are, essentially then you're not putting a fence around that that nature preserve, and not to say the Nature Conservancy does that, they really don't, but how do you look at the communities in which a nonprofit operates anywhere in the world and see them as having a voice, having a stake in the future stewardship of that land? So I think a lot about things like what are called land grabs. You look at places like Africa where there's still much of the land is still very productive, very tillable or arable land. Um, even in places we might consider very hot and dry, there's still very much productive land in Africa that as we speak, um, there are large pools of capital, there are large investment pools, um, often with US roots that buy up land around the world in what's called farmland investing. And farmland investing on its own doesn't sound like a bad idea, but what's happening, 
that I'm concerned about are huge areas. I mean, tens of thousands of acres at a time in places like Tanzania or Ethiopia or other parts of the world where these investment pools have identified the most productive land. They've worked with tribal leaders or government leaders to say, we would like to acquire this, we're going to help create jobs. But essentially the pattern is industrial agriculture on a huge scale in developing parts of the world and the people living in those communities on that land either becoming employees of those industrial farms or uh, moving off into urban areas which as we all know are essentially slums that keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger in many many cities. So how do we take that farmland investing model which some people would call land grabs and turn it into an investing model for a nonprofit that is actually about keeping people on that land, finding new ways to produce on that land and not export it to a market like Europe, but produce food and and energy and you know wood and whatever the needs are, but do it at that bioregional scale. And I think that's the opportunity I see are global nonprofits working with community boards or community representation to create um, essentially bioregional economies through a new form of commons that is not driven by investment but is driven by reinvesting in land and reinvesting in people. Yeah, it sounds like the farm investment model is an extension of colonialism, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there, you know, if, if you take the political terms that we use and, and we're trying to wake up to these legacies of abuse of land and commodification of land, then yes, uh, if you're not calling that land a colony of, of a country, it can suddenly become essentially a colony that's just under the title of whoever owns it and whatever um, company or group of companies own it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, so I think farmland investing can be done with a whole different mindset as well as timber investing, et cetera. Mm -hmm. and I'm excited about the possibilities there as long as there's local representation and it's not an imbalance. Yeah, local representation is something we've talked about in other uh, episodes when we were talking about um, blue carbon, making sure the local communities around the mangrove forests are involved in it and, and you know, trying to, trying to keep the people who are on the land on the land and making it beneficial for everyone involved. And ecological design. I mean, if we take an industrial mindset everywhere we put our foot down on this planet, it, it's not going to work. We, we have to act as though we are part of the natural systems, which we are. Mm -hmm. So we've hit on a lot of really good topics here. Um, maybe some of our listeners want to learn more, whether it's about certain topics, if you have resources you can direct them to, or about the organizations you're involved in directly. What sort of resources can you point us towards to learn more? Yeah, great. Thanks for asking. Um, so we mentioned Agrarian Trust, which is the nonprofit that I work with. Um, that is agrariantrust.org. They have a great website. So you'll see a great model for an American-based national movement of creating a commons for food production. And I'm also involved with formation of a nonprofit called the Permaculture Living Lands Trust. And it's a really exciting idea that, you know, permaculture is a global movement with thousands of people who've learned skills, taken these trainings, and then combining that with the global conservation movement, which is essentially saying let's create these nonprofits to own land and hold it in trust for community benefit. So combining those two, we, we're creating the Permaculture Living Lands Trust, and that is on Facebook. We're creating our webpage now, but it's Permaculture Living Lands Trust uh, under Facebook. You'll see us, so check that out. But um, my work is going to continue in in those avenues um, with those types of organizations, and um, I, I think there are many others out there. So if you're interested in, you know, my personal recommendations for your own life path and your own research, I'm always happy to share ideas. Um, so I guess you can make sure my email is in there somewhere. Exactly. We'll yeah. link you up in the show notes for sure. Um, do you want to? Would you like sharing some information about the? Um, you and your wife are on an indigo farm, is that correct? Thanks for asking, yeah, so my wife is a textile artist. She is originally from France and um, 
her company that she launched five years ago is called Qi Design in Indigo, like Qi, like energy in Chinese. Um, so C H I Design Indigo, and she has a website. dot com. She, um, because we live in South Carolina, and because there is a history here of working with indigo plants to produce that magical blue dye. Um, She has actually started her business to to look at the future of indigo,、um, not only in South Carolina but in other places such as France and and her homeland. So、um, we're excited about that. She's she's done some excellent work with creating textiles for personal fashion or for interior design. But we do that in a way that grows the same plant that was grown here in the 1700s. s、um, Unfortunately, it has that heaviness of the slave economy because it was a A plant that was grown、uh, on plantations by slaves, but the story is there was a woman na- named Eliza Lucas Pinkney who was a teenager who、uh, essentially developed a way of producing indigo with slaves、uh, that was able to be exported to England from about the 1740s through the 1770s as one of the main sources of dye for、uh, textiles all over Europe.、Um, But when the British lost the Revolutionary War, that industry went away,、uh, and to this day, when you buy natural indigo dye, much of it comes from the Bengal region of India, and that's where the British moved their、uh, production at that time. So we're part of a, a whole network of producers here in South Carolina working to bring back indigo, and really, indigo is a global product. It's really a type of dye that comes from many different types of plants, and people. In Africa, people in Asia, people in Peru have figured out for thousands of years how to produce these dyes, natural dyes from plants. So we're just the latest in a very long line of people working with these plants, but doing it in a way that could show a, a path forward for how to relocalize fiber, how to relocalize、um, not only food production but production of the clothing on our backs, perhaps as part of a bioregional. As well, so if you're familiar with fiber shed, the concept of a fiber shed that's a really important concept. We we know about water sheds where we get our drinking water. We can think about food sheds as where we get our food from. But a fiber shed might mean that if our genes are made in China, that's a pretty big global reach. But there is the capacity to produce at least some clothing from products grown within. The Places that we live.、Mm-hmm. So interesting. I, I look forward to to seeing some of your wife's work and maybe getting my hands on it. I've noticed a resurgence in natural dyes in this area in particular. Even、uh, the the wife of my veterinarian does natural dyes using onion and、mm-hmm. vegetables and stuff like that. And the colors that come from it are just beautiful. So that's exciting. Well, David, I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. It's super interesting. I could talk to you forever about land and land in common, and our food systems and、um, bio regency and all that sort of stuff. So I appreciate you being with us. Well, thank you, Fiona. It's so nice to be here, and long live the earth. Yes, thank you, David. Thank you. <laughs>